Mr. Anonyous finally came back with more 10 sword cut content. The insane power behind Rimuru's wildest creation yet, Tempest Labyrinth, let's go. If you've ever wondered how Ramorous holds the position that she does, this right here is the reason why. Imagine a reality marble and domain expansion combined together, all with little to no limitations whatsoever. She is just playing Sims, huh? Her powers just lets her just transfer everything, customize everything, what, to pretty much whatever they want. Seriously, she's quite literally an omnipotent god who can do whatever she wants in this realm. The absolute ruler over a dimension of her own creation. This is the power behind one of the coolest things I've ever seen any isekai protagonist do, and it's a large part of what I want to talk about in this video here. Okay. So, in addition to the labyrinth and the details left out from its creation, here's Mazecraft and why it's one of the most OP skills out there. But first, just in case you haven't- Ah, oh, fuck, it's been such a long time since we watched an Annie's Cut content video. I, I, I forgot to time the ad, ad segue, but yes. Mujin collab, guys. Mujin collab. Get your t-shirt. Get your t-shirts. But anyway, Macecraft. The skill responsible for creating Tempest's Labyrinth and an ability so OP that even Rimuru is constantly shocked by what it can do. It was as soon as he understood the full scope of what it was capable of that he decidedly concluded, in terms of defense, Ramorus's Macecraft couldn't be more superior. There was just so much power behind the ability to have unrestricted control over everything. Power that gets more ridiculous the more we talk about it. Mm -hmm. So, what is it that Mazecraft does exactly? Well, it's an intrinsic skill that makes Ramorous the supreme god of any labyrinth she's created. It can be as big or as small as she wants, and anything within or even around it then becomes subject to her absolute authority. So it's like, again, like a reality marble, the labyrinth. You create a labyrinth, it's her domain, and she can configure whatever she wants as if she's playing Sims in that labyrinth. Anything alive and conscious she first requires their permission to, but anything non-living she can control any which way she wants. So if you give consent to Ramiris saying, you can, you know, uh, control me whatever you want, what could she really... She can just... What, what could she do to the humans too then? What this means is that before gaining control over those which have a will of their own, yeah. they first need to understand what they're walking into is a labyrinth. Unless they acknowledge that this is what they're doing, Ramorous can refuse their entry and block anyone from traversing her lap. So if you don't believe in the labyrinth, Ramorous can kick it out. There's some sort of faith component to this? It makes it so the people who enter are the people who want to, and by doing so, they're effectively giving Ramorous that permission Consent. she requires. Got it. So, permission wasn't so much this formal contract, but... Basically, you can get consent of... It, like, it, animate object, no, not at, inanimate object, you can control whatever you want, but people with free will, anything, if they believe in the concept of the labyrinth and they agree to walk in, then that's giving Ramirez all the control and she can then configure them as well. But rather the simple mindset of knowing what you were walking into. That being the case, you couldn't carry someone who was asleep into the labyrinth since the person sleeping wouldn't know they were entering one. Okay. If they were awake and you were trying to forcefully drag them in, Ramorous would simply resist and make it impossible. As for everyone else, it's the moment they take their first step in that they've essentially agreed to Ramorous's conditions and accepted her rule over them. They'd become subject to a fearsome authority that seemingly knows no boundaries. Sometimes that power could extend even beyond the labyrinth, since say there were adventurers simply hovering by the entrance, Ramorous could take their weapons and armor without them even giving her permission. Hmm. If their equipment had consciousness then that was a different story, but anything else was hers for the taking. So, if a power like that was available even outside her labyrinth, I'm sure you can imagine what it is she can do within. It's something Rimuru was curious to figure out himself, so can anyone be defeated in the labyrinth then? It sounds like Ramirez is God within the labyrinth and there's literally nothing you can do because she has consent over you. She can pretty much do whatever she wants. She's invincible in there. He decided to go and ask her five follow-up questions. Questions we did already get answers to in the anime, but here's a summary and a bit of extra info for them. There was virtually no limit to the number of floors Ramorous could make, and it didn't matter how wide or deep each of them went either, since so long as she had enough energy, Ramorous could create anything. 
Okay. The reason she kept it to 100 is because anything beyond that started to require exponentially greater sums of magic. It wasn't something she could reasonably sustain anymore. Monsters could be seeded with the right amount of magicules, and magicule density directly correlated to the monster's power level. It was this convenient property that made it possible to fine-tune the Labyrinth's difficulty level. Right, that was a really clever way to scale the difficulty, because like the closer you are to the end floor where Veldoror is, the more dense the Magicules is. So the monster that gets spawned by that density of Magicule, right, the strength is proportionate to it. So the further away you are from it, the weaker the monsters are. Then with each floor taking an hour to build, the internal structure took about an hour to build as well. It was once that initial setup was completed though that more changes couldn't be made for another 24 hours. A complete day had to pass before any floor could be edited after their last revamping. These edits came with restrictions of their own since organic matter wasn't something she could produce out of nothing. It made it so each floor was typically these uninspired mazes of similar looking corridors. Blank walls and nothing else. Yeah, not really it was, pretty. however, easy enough to decorate, so that wasn't something Rimuru was particularly worried about. What he was was with regards to the complete wizardry behind what happens when someone dies in her labyrinth. They can Rimuru live. didn't understand it himself, but whether it be a monster or a human, so long as Ramorus was aware of it, she could revive anyone. Right, because again, this is her domain. But I thought that bracelet needed to be done. I thought there was something special about the bracelet. It's because Ramirez created that bracelet that acts as like an extra life. It's the reason she requires their permission before entering, since by accepting her rules, it allows her to keep very close tabs on their status. She didn't like being responsible for other people's deaths, so in the past when some unlucky adventurer did die, she'd simply revive them then send them on their way again. It's like the perfect environment for training, seriously. There's like no threat of dying, There's, you can just go all out. Ramers is it's, it's just like a simulation training. It's exactly what she would have done had Rimuru lost to that golem all that time back. Reviving did require quite a bit of magic though, so in the case there was something like an entire party that got wiped, it was far easier to resurrect them using her revival equipment. Yep. They were special items that returned the dead alive outside the labyrinth. The basis for the bands we see her make. So like, hold up. What scene is this from? Is this from an OVA? Or is it a different isekai actually entirely? Special items that returned the dead alive outside the labyrinth. Outside the labyrinth. So this equipment will resurrect you outside the labyrinth. To resurrect them using her revival equipment. They were special items that returned the dead alive outside the labyrinth. Got it. The basis for the bands we see her make later on in the anime. Fast forward now to the Labyrinth's construction, and that's where we see firsthand the separation between the real world and the Labyrinth dimension. Though exactly the same to how it was in the real world, the floor the Beast Folk now live on is on a completely separate dimensional space. One that is linked to the outside, so a day-night cycle was already pre-established, and weather like rain can be produced whenever Ramorous wants. The rest of the floors aren't so livable, since that's the dungeon Rimuru is trying to make. As he describes it himself, what he wants to create is a real-time, real-life strategy game. A theme I'm sure we all picked up from the way that he designed it, but to properly confirm his intentions, this was what he was going for. A dungeon filled with loot that got harder the further you progressed it. I don't know about you, but to me the whole thing seems pretty much like a roguelite. Yeah. Especially when you consider- It would be cool, like in roguelike, where each floor you would get different types of buffs or passives to kind of scale with you different powers that you can get to help you, you know, proceed in the labyrinth. ...how floors can be interchanged with each other, and individual floors can be modified every 24 hours. Where Rimuru takes this one step further is the way that he uses Veldora to populate it. You see, if Rimuru's the architect and Ramorus the builder, then... Veldora is the laborer? I don't know. He's the oil? We're using his magic tools to populate everything. Veldora's the power supply keeping Battery. everything running. Yeah. It's his magic tools which support everything that makes this labyrinth a dungeon. The word Rimuru chose was actually Overlord, but that was just a cool sounding term to get Veldora interested. Okay. I also like to think it was the author making a reference. Maybe. In any case, this wasn't so much about Veldora being the final boss, but was rather just a good excuse to get him to release his aura. Reason being that the only- 
If he doesn't, then he'll go out and destroy a whole fucking country nation, then we're gonna be at war again. Things standing between Tempest and a mass casualty event was literally Valdora's willpower and nothing else. It was far too dangerous to stake so many lives on him alone. But like, no one even like thinks about that because like, of how dangerous he could be because like, even like Ramirez, right? The whole thing about Ramirez and why people think that she's weak is she's just a cute little fairy who's you know, has this persona of like, oh, I'm a useless need, I want a job, so she got a job now, and she's all cunny, but if you really think about it, she's actually one of the most, like, broken beings in this, you know, this, this series. Same with Veldra, now he's just like this, you know, cute, just weeb, just reading manga, but he could just lay waste to a nation if we don't have this under control. Like, had he lost control and released it anywhere even remotely close to Tempest, such a high concentration of magic kills would kill anything below the B rank instantly. Okay. And to Rimuru, that was pretty much everyone outside his personal administration. So, by having Veldora release it here in Ramorus's domain, the isolated space she'd created meant the magic kills wouldn't leak at all. It was impossible for them to cross from the labyrinth. Thank you, Abin, for the gift of sub, man. I appreciate that. ...dimension into the real world. This was shortly after all the floors were finally built, then it was after that that a lot of the more intricate details were worked out. Things like the block system, which rearranged the order and format of floors, then save points every 10 floors, which made use of Rimuru's spatial motion. Right, but there was that one thing that Ramirez couldn't do. What was that limitation? I think we were talking about different types of weathers, like lightning storm floor or like... Know, typhoon, different stuff like that, but Ramirez, that's that was beyond her scope of power, right? These were literal checkpoints adventurers could always restart at, and they would be there for any person killed during their expedition. That or those who were returning to continue a previous one. Either way, death was a core part of the whole experience. Whether it was a boss being slain or the adventurers themselves, <laughs> Ramirez's macecraft the solo leveling scene was always going to be funny to me. Because of how confident this guy was with speed. And his foot got cut off. Adventurers themselves, <laughs> Ramorus's macecraft could revive either. So long as they were a consenting part of her realm, she was pretty much free to do absolutely anything with them. Of course, that all changed if she herself was killed, but in a rare case like that, then everything would disappear. Aside from that, any and all servants would get revived at a save point, and a servant was anyone with whom she'd forged a pact with. Mm -hmm. They were those who she simply agreed to the presence of. So, once again, Rimuru was blown away by just how powerful such a skill was, since it essentially made her and her minions invincible. In the sure, that only though. worked on those who were part of her world, but that alone was incredible regardless. Just, uh, never go into her world. Like, Ramirez has such a big gimmick where if you enter the labyrinth, you cannot defeat her. But just don't enter the labyrinth then. It's just that simple. Well, she could just hide in the labyrinth. What about destroying the labyrinth from outside? How would that work? Right? Because, like, I understand that once you're in it, you're basically within her domain. But if you're not within it, the gates of the labyrinth, why would it be indestructible? Wouldn't a being like Veldra be able to destroy the labyrinth from outside without even going in? Isn't that possible? It enhanced Beretta and Trainee to a level Rimuru couldn't even imagine. Trainee was already strong in the real world, but with that small minor addition of becoming immortal, Rimuru was sure that not even Benimaru or Shion could beat her. Damn. Really? What about Diablo? Uh, I, Benny... I, I think Diablo is definitely the strongest, you know, being right now in Rimuru's team. If we ignore people like Veldra. But Benny and Shion, really, trainee over Benny and Shion, even like Beretta? That's just how game-changing such an attribute was. But that's only within the Labyrinth, though. Now, automatic resurrection worked fine for trainee and Beretta, but when it came to doing so for hundreds or thousands of people, to keep track of each simply wasn't possible. Oh! I thought they just wanted to make a shitload of money. That's why they're using the bracelet system. Because, like, you know, why give them bracelets? Sorry, why save them? If we're trying to make as much money, then, like, you know, selling the bracelets would be so easy. Remember, a person can only revive if Ramorous wants them to. If you stumbled into the labyrinth, died, and Ramorous didn't know you died, then odds are you wouldn't be resurrected ever. Okay. So, in order to fix what was nothing more than a scaling problem, Ramirez went and created those bracelets we saw. 
magical items that automatically imbued people with the immortal attribute. She had also created return whistles too, which just like an escape rope, immediately returned adventurers to the surface. Convenient. And those bracelets would never work outside a labyrinth, right? These creations don't even exist outside a labyrinth, because I'm just thinking like, if we just had that bracelet on and we fought someone outside and we could simply resurrect, sounds unfair, sounds very busted. So these are again, everything is limited within the labyrinth. They were two items that were essentially just Ramorous's power in physical form. Power Rimuru wanted to replicate for himself, but to his displeasure, unfortunately, couldn't. Whatever it was that made Mazecraft intrinsic to Ramorous, it was unique to her and only her. Now, it's because a lot of the inner workings weren't yet set up that Veldora's magicules could hit pretty much everywhere. The lack of walls and corridors meant the magicules could reach every corner evenly. Then with ducts and stairways connecting each floor to the next, the Magicules could reach the floors above no problem. In fact, Veldora's Magicules were so incredibly dense and potent that at 50 floors up, the concentration of them was still higher than the deepest parts of the cape he was sealed in. Really? So, if back there you'd find A-ranked Tempest Serpents, I can only imagine what next level monsters would be created now. It was just a matter of time until some heavy-hitting juggernauts spawned. Milim's Dragons. In any case. This was all beneficial to understanding the very nature of Magicules, since to have access to such a dense and constant supply, it opened up avenues for research that Rimuru had never even thought of before. It was turning out to be a much more vital asset than Rimuru had initially planned it to be, so much so that he didn't think Trainee alone was enough to protect it. This was partially why he gave Beretta to Ramorous, since to have her there too made Rimuru a lot more comfortable. She and Trainee were now these immortal servants, and they would reap the benefits of such even more than Ramorous herself. It was the start of what could very well be a terrifying path leading towards Ramorous's true potential. Oh? What I mean is that if two invincible powerhouses seemed intimidating already, then what would a potential army of thousands look like? It was but again, these are all within the labyrinth. This cannot exist outside a labyrinth, so isn't this kind of just... Pointless? It was a fearsome thought that Rimuru could only shudder at. Like, Trainee and Beretta are invincible in the labyrinth, but outside, they are not invincible. These are all rules within the labyrinth. If you have a fucking army of those invincible beings, if you can't have them exist outside a labyrinth, then what is the point? The prime reason behind how he came to the conclusion that Macecraft was the best defensive skill. Even if her ranks weren't that powerful individually, just having control over all of Veldora's monster spawn was more than enough to put quite a bit of respect on her name. Even more so if they all possessed the immortal attribute. Is it possible to make the entire region of Tempest as a labyrinth? Have everything within the jurisdiction of Tempest part of Mazecraft? And now, in terms of defense, like, families could never fucking attack us, like they did in Season 2. No nation could ever- even the angels can't do shit, because they'd have to agree to, you know, go into the labyrinth and they get fucked up. But uh, that's, that's just too overpowered. That just doesn't sound balanced. That's probably impossible to do. Why is it then that no one fears her like that? Well, that's simply- Because she's a dumbass fucking neat fairy and the author continuously portrays her as a non-serious threat even though she's so powerful. It comes down to Ramorous being Ramorous. She could quite literally have limitless, infinite Tsukiyomi and Ultra Instinct, and I'm sure everyone would treat her exactly the same. To them, she's just this tiny, lovable pixie. Yep. Not some evil overlord capable of commanding an unstoppable army of invincible monsters. Hey, stop it with the spoilers! Well, at least that's what Remaru thinks anyway. It was after this that the floors started to be filled in, and it was about as daunting as you might think it was. I mean, when you have to build a maze within an area 800 feet side to side, it was only a matter of time before something like that got boring, especially when you had to do it 99 times after. For context on how big that actually is though, imagine a maze the size of Tokyo's baseball stadium, then- How the fuck am I supposed to imagine that? I've never been there. What the fuck kind of- Why would you use Tokyo Baseball Stadium as an example? I bet like 0.1% of the people watching this video could relate. Like, I don't know, give me something else like a fucking football stadium. I don't- something that everyone can just like vision. Imagine that repeated 99 times downward, getting smaller in an inverse pyramid formation. Okay. That's the estimated space that Rimuru was dealing with here. 
If we were to look at Floor 1 specifically though, this was best described as the demo area. A tease of what's to come below and a level not so hard that beginners wouldn't be able to traverse it. Sure, it may still be slightly challenging, but with the hallways wide, passageways clears, and monsters weak, Rimuru made it very difficult to get stuck or lost anywhere. It was intended to ease adventurers into the no. adventure of it all and build excitement towards what to expect later. There was, however, the caveat of it being rather big, so Rimuru was worried people might spend time mapping the floor only to find nothing. To him, the worst case scenario was for people to start dissing the labyrinth without exploring further. Hmm. A concern he hoped would be mitigated by monster drops and magic crystals. We need to bait them in the beginning. Treat them all nice, have these amazing drops, and be like, wow, this is so nice, this is so easy, and then slap them up the next floor. That beginner layout stayed the same all the way to floor 5, then on floor 6 and below is where things got trickier. Not enough that anyone should die, but it was here that some of the more simple traps would be introduced. To give you an idea of what some of these traps were... That's the silliest trap, bro. The whole point of this trap right over here is a rotating door, so you don't know which where you came from. Is that the exit? Is that the entrance? Uh-oh, we spun around like 17 times, or are we? Swear. If it was possible to imagine, then Ramorous could create it. It was pretty much everything you'd expect in Elden Ring or a Dark Souls game. This in See, that's how, that's how mimics should be in Frieden. But in Frieden, the mimics are so nice, right? Frieden should be getting gobbled up like this and being bloodied up. Souls game. This included poison arrows and swamps, floors that both moved and rotated, bladed wires barely visible, pitfalls and mimics, exploding chests and magic traps, closed rooms, dark areas, narrow areas, and special areas. A lot of these weren't even that bad alone, but when combined together, it could make for quite the impossible scenarios. Interesting challenges of strength, agility, wit, and fortitude. For ones that tested your knowledge like the closed rooms, if you're wondering how that was even possible, well, in addition to being able to create A any physical room? object she wants, Ramorous's magic can also control the air composition. Right, it was like devoiding them of oxygen in that closed room, right? Shin too. So, if Rimuru wanted a room that was limited in oxygen, the only thing he needed to do was ask. Like, even now when they were 100 floors deep, Ramorus's power made the air hair no different from how it was on the surface. It was another reminder of how crazy her macecraft skill is. So, these were the traps one could expect, but the more hard ones wouldn't appear until after floor 10. Floors 6 to 9 were still intended to nice ease one. everyone into it, since if the beginning was too hard, then people would be discouraged from trying again. Yeah, you need to scale it Floor easily. 10 was when the training wheels came off, though, since the Guardian there was, in Rimuru's own words, kind of strong. Gleam eyes? He hadn't decided who exactly he was going to put Minotaur? there yet, but it definitely wasn't going to be a pushover. It should be Gopta. It should be Gata, bro. should be... yeah, you gotta have the first, like, small boss. Gopta. The ideal candidate was a monster ranked around the B level. These floor bosses got special equipment of their own since the circumstances of their life was a bit different from the adventurers. You see, as unintelligent monsters not Cutting capable breeze. of understanding permission, every boss was given what's called a resurrection caller. It was an item that- Basically, what? You kill a monster, then they respawn later? Let the wearer be resurrected without having formed a pact with Ramorous. Yeah. This was the perfect item to ensure the floor boss was always present, but when you really think about it, it's actually pretty messed up. Like, imagine coming to life, then being forced to fight to the death over and over again. Yeah. Like, if you really think about it, if you take a step back and, you know, the whole elaborate thing is just all fun and games to us, but if you think about it from, like, the monster's perspective of how they get continuously just put into the simulation to fight to their death and come back to life and over and over and over, it is ethically cruel what we're doing, but fuck it, they're monsters. You can never escape the constant loop of death because every time you do die, Ramorous just brings you back again. What a monster. It's almost like a sick form of torture where not even death was Ew. an escape. That's just me thinking about it from the monster's perspective, but from a business side, it's more than it's perfect. It's genius. Aside from that, the fact Ramorous could bestow such power into items was a wonder in and of itself. It seems her skill lets her change the effects of any item she wants. She can just basically do whatever the fuck she wants in this domain. But changing the weather. 
But anyway, the boss room was the entirety of floor 10, which allowed for complete safety after the boss was defeated. Loot was rewarded randomly from a chest after, then a door would open leading to the next floor. It was after this that one could start to find hidden areas and chest traps, then so on and so forth as difficulty scaled with depth. By the end, the finished product was something far beyond ruthless. It was a level of difficulty that even Raphael found to be a bit much. When considering the skills of the average adventurer, the crafty traps and lesion of upper-level monsters provided an experience that made Vicious seem tepid. There was a good chance that the later difficulty wasn't balanced at all. Which adventurers is even going to show up to be able to clear this shit? Maybe Masayuki. Of I don't know, because like the idiot trio is not going to do anything. No regular adventure is going to do anything. You need like extremely strong, like even a party of all demon lords. Yeah, they could probably clear up to the top. But like regular adventurers, I'd love to see Masayuki in the in the dungeon. At least not for those who you would consider average. Now, the dragon bosses are something I actually want to talk about in a separate video. Okay, Milim's dragons will be a separate video. So aside from knowing that they reside in floors 96 to 99, the only other thing worth mentioning is the operational stuff, specifically the loot buyback system that Rimuru set in place for everyone. Since a guild outpost didn't exist yet in Tempest, Rimuru decided he was going to set up one of his own. He didn't want people to have to travel to Blumund just to sell some gear. So what he did to prevent that was establish what was pretty much a pseudo-guild. Basically, adventurers bring their loot out, they want to sell that shit, we pay them out, easy. A convenient place where adventurers could sell their rewards at a discount. Okay. It may not be standard market price, but if they didn't want to leave Tempest, then- At a discount. So like, we're, we're cutting them, but they have no choice because- They'd have to go to Brumen to sell it at a higher cost, but they're like the convenience factor is such that they're gonna get away with it by ripping them off. So we're making money off of them. Like, like, we're, we're deducting, like, instead of like paying them 10 bucks for this shit, we're like, we'll pay you like six. And it's just like, it's still a better deal at the end of the day for you guys, even though you could get 10 somewhere else because of the distance. And this was the only option they had. It was a clever way to cycle money back into the economy, Genius. all while making savings from the price differential. Genius. Other installments included in Labyrinth Vendors, the bulk of which would either be basic food or healing potions, both obviously marked up due to their convenience. That's fucked up. Everything is marked up, bro. Everything is just marked up. Just like when you go to Disneyland, right? You got nowhere to eat, so you have to buy these $20 churros because that's the only thing that fucking exists, right? You're stuck there. You have no other options. Therefore, they have the leverage to, you know, sell you at that marked up price. What are you going to do about it? There were a few other business ideas Rimuru had as well, but that was the majority Burgers of what fries, he implemented. So, all in all, this is probably one of the coolest things I've ever seen any Isekai protagonist do. The Labyrinth setup definitely is interesting. It's just not the most exciting content. For sure, the whole Sims aspect of, you know, configuring, you know, the floors with Rammers and stuff, that did blow my mind. It's a feat that goes beyond just being powerful and extends further into a world of its own. Exactly. It's not just powerful. It's like the overall utility and convenience of what you're able to do. Just like creating your own domain simulation training. It's insane. I mean, it's as if Rimuru just created his own little Danmachi universe. Pretty much. It was pretty awesome. Like, pretty much, Rammer just created his own fucking Tower of God, right? These dungeons, right? It's pretty much that. Some ...to see something like this come to life, and I'm glad they did a deep dive into how they did it. I still think the Resurrection Caller is pretty diabolical, but aside from that, the logistics, business, and adventure are all just fun. Hey, it's all about money at the end of the day. Who cares if those monsters have an existential crisis of why am I, you know, resurrected just to die again? It was an entertaining topic I thought you all might have wanted to know more about. But yeah, that's this week's deep dive into some more Tensura lore, and I'll all be right. back next week with a certain character's power profile. Thank goodness, and maybe Masayuki, I'm not sure. He said he's also going to be covering, you know, uh, Milim Dragon stuff on a separate video. So I'm glad that Mr. Annie News is back with the cut content. Guys, please go to his channel. Like this video and sub to his channel if you haven't. And I will see you on the next video.